All right, so um, welcome everybody. I'm very excited to uh, moderate this uh, webinar of uh, fossil fuels underneath protected areas. And I'm also excited to introduce our, our speakers and the agenda. Um, we will be starting with Kjell Kune and Alice McGowan. So Kjell is the director of the Leave It in the Ground initiative. And Alice is our data scientist and GIS expert. And they're going to talk about our project, um, which mapped the overlap of fossil fuels and protected areas worldwide. And they will talk a little bit about the rationale behind this project, uh, some key numbers uh, and a few case studies as well. We'll follow that with a short Q&A uh, and then go ahead with Mark Campanale, who is the founder of the Carbon Tracker Initiative. And he's been working for 20 years in sustainable financial markets uh, as a co-founder of some of the first responsible investment funds. And he's going to be sharing the market uh, and financial perspective uh, on this topic. And uh, we'll follow with uh, Joe Eisen, who is the executive director of the Rainforest Foundation UK. And he will be taking a closer look about the situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as talking a little bit about some wider perspectives. So not just limiting to protected areas, but also other issues that are really important when talking about this topic. And uh, after that, another Q&A. So yeah, just uh, a few housekeeping uh, mentions. So for the Q&A, if people could raise their hands um, and I will be calling you uh, and noting down the order. Uh, also just a, a gentle reminder for people to keep their microphones on mute um, if they are not uh, asking questions. Um, and yeah, with, uh, with that, uh, Kiel, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Francesco, for the introduction. And let me share my screen here. So to kick this off, uh, just in case you haven't come across Lingo yet, um, as an organization, we're a small organization working on accelerating the fossil end game. And some of the things we do is identify carbon bombs around the world, uh, trying to find pathways for fossil fuel companies like Pimex to move beyond fossil fuel extraction and uh, setting up and hosting a climate action matrix called fossil free zones. And this piece of work that we're going to present today has to do with the fact that in our perspective, the fossil fuel age is a strange age. If you look at the whole of human history, it's, a, it's like a flash in the pan. It's a short blip. And uh, we started at Lingo from the understanding that most fossil fuels need to stay in the ground. Uh, we think that we're uh, already entering the fossil end game. So the next couple of years, we'll see us moving out of the fossil age. And it would be tragic if in the last few years of the fossil age, we destroyed beautiful natural heritage and destroyed uh, the living spaces of many species via fossil fuel extraction. So um, that is what motivates us to point to the coincidence of protected areas and fossil fuel extraction. Now, in theory, there should be no fossil fuel extraction inside protected areas. World conservation congresses have repeatedly resolved that governments should prohibit any mineral exploration or extraction activities inside all categories of uh, protection. But governments uh, have a hard time actually doing that. Many governments are heavily influenced by industry and by uh, you know, moneyed interests. So what we see in, in reality is that many protected areas get downgraded, downsized, degazetted. And so we see this as a huge challenge because you know the, uh, the growth mindset and economic development, all these things that are still very much present in mainstream thinking, uh, lead us to encroach on these natural spaces. And we really need to find ways to push back against that and defend them. And uh, climate change mitigation could be one more reason 
uh, to do so. And with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Alice, who is going to uh, talk us through the analysis that we have done. Thanks, Gal. Um, let's see if I can share my screen. All right. All right, everybody see that okay? Okay, great. All right, so welcome to our briefing on fossil fuel extraction in the world's protected areas. Uh, as Kel mentioned, my name is Alice. I'm a geospatial researcher at LINGO, the Leave It in the Ground Initiative. And I am so excited to share with you today our global map and statistics. So let's dive in. Now, I like to structure presentations like this around questions. Today, we're gonna to answer four questions and starting with the most important, why? Why focus on protected areas? Well, protected areas are regions that we've already determined to be worth saving. If we're gonna stop dangerous fossil fuel extraction, these protected areas are really the best place to start with non-extraction policies. Also, beyond ecological reasons, Protected areas are often sites of national, cultural, and religious importance. So beyond just the, the natural world, these are important areas to humans. And of course, fossil fuel projects and the accidents associated with them often cause outside harm in protected areas due to their undisturbed nature. And you know, before we really get started on, on looking at some of the numbers, I think it's important to really be reminded of the very real impacts we're talking about. Each project represents a loss of nature. These are just a few examples here of the lasting harm oil drilling and coal mining has on areas that are already set aside for preservation. We can see a kind of half-hearted attempt to clean, uh, to clean up in the uh, National Park in Ecuador. Uh, down below that, we see uh, the Amazon National Forest where production and uh, exploitation and is, is being ramped up. That's a brand new site. Uh, in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. And then of course, right here in my own home country, the US, uh, you don't have to look too far to find oil, uh, damage and tar from oil. Um, and um, actually, wait, I think this is from coal. So this is uh, from a coal spill, coal ash and coal sludge in, in a national park that I've, I've actually gotten to visit. So Let's jump into the methodology that we use to track and quantify extraction projects in the world's protected areas. Now, we use databases from Rystad Energy for oil and gas and Global Energy Monitor for coal. Then these are great because they list fossil fuel projects around the world. We added into that uh, a database of protected areas from the I IUCN, which was, again, also global. After a bit of data sanitization, which is really just about deduplicating, cleaning things up, and label normal normalization. So if one data set refers to Congo, comma, DR, and another data set refers to Democratic Republic of Congo, they would both be treated as, as the same country. From there, we moved on to geoprocessing. Now, this is where we identified which of those many projects, those oil and gas and coal projects, were actually in protected areas. And we moved on to summarizing the statistics on those projects, which we developed into per protected area stats and per country stats. So that's a lot of math. <laughs> what are the actual results? Well, we're previewing the first version of this data today in both written form as well as a detailed map that lets people see how countries are doing and pinpoints actual project sites in protected areas. Globally, we are tracking close to 3,000 oil, gas, and coal projects in the world's legally protected areas. Again, legally protected areas. This includes countless projects that are still in the planning and development stage which indicates we're actually ramping up um, dirty fossil fuel projects in the world, some of the world's most delicate places. All right, well, that's a, that's a big number, but where are actual countries sitting in that? Well, oops. 
Okay, so let's take a quick look at the top 10 countries. I use the phrase top 10 very loosely um, by number of fossil fuel projects. So looking at this, you might be surprised at a few of the countries listed here. Um, offshore, offshore drilling and protected areas of the North Sea really puts the UK and several European nations into play. But it's important to mention that we're only counting nationally recognized and legally protected areas. If we were to include private reserves and what we call areas of other effective conservation, well, this number would grow even higher. All right, well, that's fine for a number of projects, but what does that mean for actual climate change? Well, in terms of climate impact, fossil fuel projects in protected areas are on track to release at least 47 and a half gigatons, that's gigaton, billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Now that's a massive, massive number. And again, keep in mind, we're just looking at extraction in protected areas, ignoring all of the unprotected areas and the areas that used to be protected and are no longer protected, as Kel mentioned. So for comparison, I like to pull up China's 2021 entire CO2 emissions, which were just over 11 billion tons of CO2. That's less than one quarter of the amount we're seeing here. So this is a massive amount. And keep in mind, we're looking at the low end. We were very conservative in, in our numbers, and there's a lot of areas that this could be expanded to. Again, looking at CO2 emissions, we can see several countries have made the top 10 list again. This is a top 10 list you don't want to be on, <laughs> showing that really this is not just a developing nation crisis. Even in countries with well-developed environmental laws and legal systems, these projects continue. Now, this is where, where it gets a little juicy. We've begun uh, just now looking at this really complicated web of finance that supports extraction projects across the world's protected areas. This top 10 chart, chart shows to who the profits from oil and gas drilling in protected areas is currently going. Now, there's a lot more work for us to do along here. Um, you can see a couple of entries that say other partners in Canada, other partners in the US. And these are areas where we want to dive into the numbers a lot more deeper and start coming up with real company names, real board, all right, with real boards that board meetings that can be disrupted and and um and these subjects can be brought up in. So we can already see though some of the world's biggest corporate names showing up, Aramco, Shell. Total, Exxon, all right, along with some of our usual uh, suspects. So, all right, this is great for just getting a kind of an overall look, but well, you can explore the data and see the location of these projects yourself on our interactive map. Uh, I've got a little screenshot here, which I wish it had China in it, but um, it's still though, it's, immediate ob it's immediately obvious that the problem is widespread this isn't limited to any one country or region. Sure, there's some hot spots, but this is a global, global issue. Okay, so what's next? Obviously, we want to gather feedback, and this and this uh, webinar is important for that process. I'd, we'd love to hear feedback from you as you are using these tools. Uh, of course, going forward, we want to improve the map both in terms of usability, making it more useful to the public. And then also uh, one thing I'm ex exceptionally excited about is including deposit estimates. So we, we've got a pretty good estimate of how much fossil fuel we're on track to extract from the world's protected areas. But in addition, here at Lingo, we're also developing a map, a map and statistics showing how much recoverable fossil fuels are actually under the world's protected areas. Because again, we'd like this to stay in the ground. Um, we'll be moving to all right, we'll be moving towards identifying financiers. Uh, as you can see, we've already started that work, but I think this is such an important topic. Who's financing the destruction, specifically in the world's protected areas? And of course, after a little bit, we're going to be looking at a public launch. Um, this doesn't include, of course, our map the data, uh, several case studies, and we'll probably collect it all together on a website. And 
This last one is probably the most important, and it's building alliances for non-extraction. And we are really looking to expand our outreach to groups around the world to partner with them to change policy on the national level in countries where this is taking place. And as you can see, there's there's a lot of countries. But for now, I'd just like to leave everyone with one final message, and that's every one of these projects is an act of hypocrisy, protecting an area with one hand, destroying it with the other. That doesn't sound right. So anyway, thanks for joining us today. Um, you can sign up to receive early access to the map and data by scanning this QR code or following the link. And I will be sure to drop that in the chat as well. Um, now that we've taken a look at some global numbers, I'm honored to pass things back to Kel, who's going to be running us through some detailed case studies and some hotspots documenting the harm that these fossil fuel projects are causing. So thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Alice, um, for this overview. And I will walk us through some examples. I've just grabbed some screenshots from uh, our internal map for, and they're not in any particular order, just for you to get a sense of the, the data that we have there and the way it looks like. And, you know, to wrap your head around whether this could be useful in your own work. So here's a screenshot of Russia, which has uh, one and a half gigatons CO2 identified under protected areas. And there is a hotspot here on the Yamal Peninsula, which uh, where uh, fossil gas is getting liquefied and then shipped to Europe um, and other places. Um, the next country is uh, Venezuela, which is really a big one. And uh, here things are concentrated about around uh, Maracaibo and the lagoon that is there, which has a lot of uh, oil. And I'm seeing that the slides are moving quite slowly. So here in the Northwest of Venezuela, and that's one important hotspot with indigenous peoples living there, you know, trying to make a living and having clean water. Uh, there's Ecuador with the Yasuni uh, National Park where you showed a picture from and which has been uh, important in the discussion about keeping fossil fuels in the ground. I'll come back to that. Uh, here's an image from uh, Uganda, which some of you uh, may be aware of uh, being, you know, very contentious right now uh, because of the East African crude oil pipeline, uh, the biggest, longest heated pipeline in the world, if I'm not mistaken, to take oil and gas from protected areas and uh, cut through many uh, habitats and some colleagues have, have done good work on mapping that, which is outside. Not everything is inside protected areas. There are many other reasons why uh, you should protect places from the oil and gas industry. So we're just focusing on one and there are other colleagues doing additional pieces of work. And here's uh, the next maps from Colombia, which now has a very progressive government who has said that uh, they want to get out of fossil fuels and um, an official from the Colombian government looking after the national parks has told me they are uh, actually, you're not allowed to extract from protected areas. So we're hopeful that maybe this potential in Colombia would translate into commitments by the new Colombian government to not extract these fossil fuels. And I would like to uh, talk a little bit about two particular cases. One is Mexico, where I am based, which has about uh, 300 million tons of CO2 uh, under its protected areas. And the interesting thing is that it has already decided to not extract some of these fossil fuels. So in Chiapas, in the state where I'm living in, uh, in the Lacandon rainforest, a very biodiverse uh, region uh, with rainforest, uh, there is a safeguarded zone. And that means that oil and gas extraction is prohibited in that area. So what we have done is we have quantified the amount of potential CO2 emissions from those oil and gas deposits, and they uh, add up to 22 million tons of CO2. And we believe that this is a low hanging fruit in terms of pledging non-extraction at the UNFCCC. So in the next round of NDCs, and you may be aware that the 
Paris Agreement sets out this very ambitious 1.5 degree target, but the collective uh, mitigation uh, pledges that countries have made will not get us there. It, it will get us to uh, two or three degrees warming, not counting the danger of runaway climate change. And so in built into the Paris Agreement is this uh, ratchet mechanism where countries have to become more ambitious every uh, five years. And this year there's the global stock take. And uh, so we believe that uh, foregoing extraction in protected areas uh, is a low hanging fruit for countries to get more ambitious around mitigation and putting in stops to the fossil fuel industry and showing that there is a limit to where this industry can grow and that the days are counted. So we are uh, providing this analysis in the hopes that governments and civil society and others would take this up and move it forward towards a uh, commitment of society to not go and drill and dig in those places. And the last example I want to show you is in the United Arab Emirates, which also has close to a gigaton of CO2 under its protected areas. And the one I would like to talk about is the Marawa Biosphere Reservation, which is offshore and one of the areas where the, the UAE is expanding its oil and gas extraction. So under this biosphere reserve, which was the first biosphere reserve in the United Arab Emirates, uh, there are close to 70 million tons of CO2 in, in fossil carbon. This is about three times more than what Mexico has already pledged to keep in the ground uh, in, the, in the rainforest here. And um, it's one of the growth areas. So I, I, I assume that you may have uh, heard that COP28, which is hosted by the UAE this year, is chaired by the uh, director of ADNOC, the CEO of ADNOC, the national oil company. And um, they, are on, uh, they have goals to expand extraction. And part of that expansion is happening in the Marawa Biosphere Reserve. And this is not just some reserve. It's a very important place for sea turtles and for dugongs. Um, these are uh, uh, marine mammals who feed uh, mainly on seagrass. And inside this biosphere reserve, we have 60% of the second biggest dugong population in the world. Uh, dugongs are threatened very much. And this is a, one of their very important places where they still manage to survive but they're threatened by the oil and gas industry because they're dredging, they're building artificial islands, and uh, this will negatively impact the seagrass that the dugongs feed on. And another reason why Marawa is important is that there is uh, coral, a very special coral, because the Gulf is, is a very hot sea. And this means that the corals in that region have been exposed to heat stress in the past. So these might be... Uh, special corals that could survive the global heating that we're seeing around the world right now. So this is a very important reservoir of species and of heat adapted corals that we need for making sure coral reefs can survive in the world. So these are some of the reasons why this should uh, be protected and we hope that um, you know we will be able to uplift this and push back against this getting destroyed uh, from the oil industry. Uh, around, especially around COP28. And to, to close, I, Alice already talked about how this is uh, not just a rich and uh, poor country's problem, it's a rich country's problem as well. But I think that, you know, the conversation is shifting. And even for uh, poorer countries, there are different mechanisms starting to appear to support keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Yasuni was probably before its time, it didn't work back then, it might work these days. There are the Just Energy Transition Partnerships, there are proposals like the climate bailout and debt for climate swaps. And there is the Bridgetown process where new financial mechanisms are being explored and proposed. And these are some of the things to look at if you want to figure out a way how to convince governments to keep fossil fuels in the ground in their protected areas. So right now we're at this pre step of you know before we go public with this we want to share this with you and uh, get your feedback and uh, 
see if this would be useful for your work. Also look into the countries that you're familiar with and flag any errors or things that uh, need to be uh, improved before we make this uh, uh, a wider resource and um, Alice has been working on this for a very long time and we're very excited to invite you to uh, to join us in this effort to protect our biodiversity and uh, slow down on the climate emergency as well. So thanks for the attention and I'm looking forward to our two next speakers. Okay, thank you, Kiel. And thank you very much, Alice. I hope that our audience uh, has found some inspiration in this in these two presentations. I'd like to uh, open this 10-minute uh, Q&A now. Q &A now. Um, if uh, people can raise their hands and I'll, I'll call your names. Niv? Yes, thank you. Very, very interesting presentation. Hi, I'm from uh, Greenpeace. I'm co-leading a project uh, It's called Energy Justice. It's a new project for Greenpeace. I wouldn't talk about it too much at the moment, but it also involves a lot of different mapping, kind of thinking outside the box of what we're mapping also. Um, so I have a few questions. Uh, for you, Alice, uh, it's really, really amazing work and very, very interesting. I would like to understand when you showed a number, maps and numbers, like the number of projects um, in protected areas, and UK was the first, if I recall correctly. So how do you measure, uh, uh, first of all, the, um, uh, is this like in a region in the whole of UK or is this by UK companies that are working in protected areas because this wasn't clear to me or and and if it is by international uh, cooperatives how do you measure it and my second question is uh, how do you measure a project or how do you categorize it um, in in these numbers and my third question, do you also look into what kind of fossil fuel extraction uh, it is? Do you identify if it's conventional, unconventional, if it's uh, different uh, techniques, because there's a very wide range of uh, different extractions? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nev. Um, those are all great questions, and I, I think I might have already forgot one or two, so please remind me. Um, definitely. Uh, so looking at our data when in determining what is a protected area and what isn't a protected area essentially we dodged the question we were using the IUCN's definition of an area that is legally protected for conservation measures um now as we as we're um giving things to countries our as we're assigning things to countries you had a great question about whether are we looking at countries that are financing or just where it's located well, the main point of this project is for company is for countries to start banning um, fossil fuel extraction in protected areas. And so all of our questions were kind of based around that, mainly based around who has the power to say no to a project. And that's so when we get the numbers for the UK, we're looking at the number of pro products, projects that are based in protected areas within the UK's economic ex exclusive zone. So we're looking at where they're located. And when we note them at the top of the list, I, I can't remember, it was hundreds, if not thousands of projects, um, we're, we're, we're assigning them to the UK because we believe that the UK has the power, the UK government has the power to stop licensing in these areas and to start and to shut down extraction in protected area. And really, that's what we've done throughout the world. You know, when when even when looking at areas where control or governance, or or there might be multiple overlapping claims, whether you're looking at the South China Sea to anywhere else, we generally have looked. You know, conflict zones included. Uh, we've generally asked the question: Who has the power to stop extraction in these areas? And that's who we've assigned. Uh, and those are the countries that we've. And that's how we've assigned um, these metrics based on. Um, we're going to be getting definitely further into the financing. Um, you can already see several state um, state oil and gas companies um, listed as, as primary profit makers from extraction in protected areas. And so definitely, I would say 
watch this space um, for more information on um, on the financing for these. But yes, in this in this first um, this first data set, we're looking at where they're located. We're looking at who who has governance over that protected area, and that's the country that we've assigned responsibility <laughs> for allowing that that ex that dirty extraction to happen in that delicate area. Um, mm. I think there was there might have been a thing yeah maybe to maybe to complement uh, just on the project definition, we use the Ristat database, which is a Norwegian. A data provider for oil and gas industry, which many of you are familiar with. And we actually, we actually partnered with Oil Change International uh, on this project because they have access uh, to, to that data, which we don't. And so we took their their definition of what's grouped together. I, I don't recall if it's uh, projects or assets that they have grouped together. And that, that is what our account refers to. But I think that is an important question because if you think of a big project, and it has 150 wells, and then we count them as 150 projects, and uh, there, there might be some confusion ar around the name. So I think that's a, a very good question to look into that. And just to connect this with another piece of work that I know colleagues are doing, uh, you know, we had to buy the data to be able to identify this. And I don't think that uh, should be so. I think that should be open in the public. So the efforts about the global registry on fossil fuels is very important that everyone has access to this kind of information. Yeah, thank you. I would just say, first of all, it's it's a very interesting question for us too, because this is exactly what we're looking to. We have access to three databases. So that's why I asked you, how do you define a project? And uh, and we come exactly from the last point you said that everybody has to have. We're also mapping who has paywall, what paywall, and 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 uh, what data, and how do they collect it. So that's a lot of questions that are coming up here, and you have to be very. You have to put it in context when you present this map because it, I think these are very very important points to make. How do you your your methodology? what it is you bring and also the the issues and the challenges that are in the data okay thank yeah, well, you I think there were two, more, two more hands right yes so we have um matt then i noticed that joe upped his hand but then put it back down but we can maybe pick that up after after this go ahead matt thank you um so i have two questions um the first is, I, I well, actually, first, let me say, uh, lo love the project. It looks uh, very, very useful. And I'm curious for my first question, if, as you consider expanding or building on what you have so far, if you're planning to integrate indigenous territories as a category um, after the last biodiversity COP where indigenous territories became part of biodiversity frameworks. That's one question. Um, the second one is, um, not sure what level of data you have from Restub, um, but I'm curious if you have uh, specific gravity and sulfur um, data for the oil deposits. For those of us who do some some of the campaigning on things like Yasuni, the target markets are an important part of the campaigning, and you know we can uh, speculate where the best target markets are uh, based on that profile. So I'm, I'm curious if that data is available as part of what you are releasing publicly. Thanks. Um, yeah, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So, for on the indigenous territories, um, I would say we're we're starting with something very small and simple here. We're just taking the legally protected areas, as Alice has already mentioned. Uh, we're taking somebody uh, who has a global data set, which is not perfect. There are many issues with it, but has a global data set of protected areas. And then we're overlaying that with what we know of fossil fuel deposits. And there's another thing we had to build. We, we looked at coal right now. We're only, uh, Alice only talked about uh, the coal mines that are in GEMS global coal plan tracker in their database. But we have actually built a bottom up a data set of global coal deposits around the world just to figure out where the coal is in the world. That didn't exist. We had to build that for that for this project. And we, we, we would also be happy to, you know, uh, have a look at that together if people are interested so um you know we're starting with one thing and we already got a lot of headaches from trying to get 
global coverage on this very limited scope of work. So um, moving on to other issues is definitely uh, possible and useful. Uh, it's just a challenge of capacity, funding, and so on. Um, but you know, if there are uh, possibilities of partnerships, we'd love to you know build on this work and and include many different reasons. There are so many reasons why not to extract fossil fuels. Um, you've named one additional one, and I think there are uh, many others. And we'd love to you know make this work useful for for things that others are doing. So if you have something specific in mind, uh, definitely let us know. Uh, as for Lingo as an organization, whether we will build on that. Um, for the moment, that's not uh, being planned, but uh, it, it could be a potential in the future. Yeah, th thank you. I think uh, I think it's a super interesting question. What different categories could start getting included as it builds? And uh, you know, what, as we work to on the eighty by twenty twenty five campaign uh, at stand with with folks in South America, we're trying to protect eighty percent of the Amazon, and you know, there's a substantial number of protected areas as you mapped right now. And the question of indigenous territories uh, and you know, the equivalent protections that they offer are super important in that area. And I think also in Africa and other places as well as we see that. So I think that this is an, an amazing, uh, amazing job y'all are doing and I look forward to working with your data. Yeah, thanks. And actually that um, there, there is colleagues from Arizona State University, I think, who, who, who've done uh, this work a couple of years ago with protected areas and indigenous territories. So that, that data might still be out there. Now, I remembered your second question about the sulfur um, and API. I'm not sure if that's included in, in the RISA database. Uh, it might not be, but I think conventional versus unconventional is included. So that is something that we can say also that the companies that are involved um, we're not allowed to post that on a, in, a, in a public facing map, but you know, if you're interested in a particular place and you want to know is it co conventional, unconventional, who's doing it, and you can get in touch and we we can get that data to you. Great, thank you. All right, thank you guys. Um, I'm uh, excited to move on to um, our next two speakers now. The time for the Q and A is over. Um, Alice uh, has to uh, leave at the end of the hour. So if anybody thinks of any questions that they would like to ask her, um, you may uh, write them in the chat uh, and maybe Alice could, could, could answer there. So without further ado, uh, Mark, the floor is yours. So about that, I'm just getting my presentation up. So hopefully you'll you'll see the first slide come up. Um, Carbon Tracker, we're a nonprofit financial think tank. Our audience is primarily institutional investors, regulators, accountants, auditors. We take, I'm gonna give a, just a general overview of how we see things and how then it relates to protected areas. Um, our, our work, like the work of many of, um, of our colleagues and peers in other, research think tanks always starts with the carbon budget, how much CO2 we've got left that could be released into the atmosphere before we go above um, different levels of warming. Ideally, the answer to that is none at all, but whilst we continue to use fossil fuels, um, it's worth digging into the, looking at the, some of the detail. If the carbon budget for one and a half degrees with a 66% probability is 280 gigatons of CO2, that's roughly seven years of emissions at current levels before we go through one and a half. And then you can see the circles again uh, before we go all the way up to, to two degrees of, of warming. So time is against us. Another way of analyzing this is to think of all the proven reserves or known reserves in the ground, and then looking at how much have to be um, kept in the ground um, to keep to these different levels of warming. Um, the bet that we're interested in at Carbon Tracker is how much is owned by publicly traded corporations. Now, the reason for that is not that state-owned entities aren't important, of course they are, is that there is, apart from voting out governments where you have a vote, 
you can exercise some degree of influence if you have a shareholding through a pension scheme uh, and that pension scheme is say the New York City or New York State pension scheme or another that like USS or others which are open to using their shares to be influenced. Um, but the point I would say from this is the takeaway is, is that just the reserves owned by the world's largest publicly traded companies like Exxon and Shell and Chevron is equivalent to the remaining carbon budget to, to two degrees. Uh, and if you want to keep to one and a half degrees, um, the assets owned by some of the world's largest oil and gas companies, most of that will also have to remain in the ground. The bit that Carbon Tracker did that was slightly different from our peers is that we we decided to see which stock exchanges these uh, um, reserves were listed on um, and look at it in that way. The three major exchanges that the world should uh, be concerned about is the UK market and the US market. We can put Russia to one side for the moment. There are other important exchanges, China, South Africa, Australia, but the two key ones are, are the US and the UK. We then, last year, we then said, well, over the last 10 years, how has this changed? Um, and, and, and I think there's, I don't know, if we're a campaigning group trying to keep financiers from funding fossil fuels, um, I don't think we've succeeded because the amount of fossil fuels owned by listed companies during that 10 year period has actually gone up by a third. So stock exchange listed companies have gone from owning 700 gigatons of CO2 in their reserves to over a thousand. And the reason for that is there have been over 2,300 coal, oil and gas uh, share offerings on the world stock exchange. As those living in the UK will know that the biggest IPO that occurred um, in the UK last year and the fifth biggest in Europe was Ithaca Energy, an oil and gas company. And so these markets uh, remain open to try and um, raise more money. And that's just equity, the, the shares. If you think about how much money they borrow and the money raised on bond markets, that's about 10 times bigger than what's raised on stock exchanges. And so that's why we try and keep our focus of keeping fossil fuels away from raising money on, 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 in the markets. Here's, here's, a, here's a word that we're all familiar with, carbon bombs. Um, just a bit in there that the Guardian reported on our analysis is that we can actually analyze how much capital is going into these companies um, on planned uh, expansion of oil and gas. Uh, there, when we, this one came out about a year ago, um, was we were recording about $387 million a day of capital expenditure on exploiting oil and gas reserves. Just to stand back again, um, the scenarios that are used by different bodies um, over the years, pretty much nearly all of them plan for uh, a growing use of oil and gas. And this is one of the reasons where it seems to explain um, why many of the models are assuming more oil and gas growth. Um, uh, some of these have different scenarios, which were, I'll, 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 which you know aren't so growth orientated. But basically, if you are, if you ask a lot of oil and gas analysts, and I had a team that was at Sarah Week in Houston um, the week before last, where thousands of oil and gas professionals were there. Um, not much has changed. The the growth and business as usual is still very much part of the oil and gas industry's narrative. Um, and this is partly why uh, each year many countries continue to announce new oil and gas licenses. Just after the end of the last COP, uh, Norway announced another 60 or 70 oil and gas exploration permits. Um, and of course, these companies, Chevron, Total, many of the others um, continue to pitch for um, new exploration permits and licenses. One of the things we're hoping to do with the uh, global registry of fossil fuels, fossilfuelregistry.org, uh, which has been built by with the um, um, the help of um, uh, Global Energy Monitor. I've seen Ted on the call. Thank you, Ted, and Carbon Tracker, and a few others, is to build this open, accessible registry of information. Is we're going to try and build up more information about when these permits and licenses are going to be announced, so we can see them before they actually get announced. Uh, why this is important, and again, everyone knows this. Um, the uh, year before last, Fatty Birrell and the IEA said that to uh, keep one and a half degrees in sight, 
uh, no new investment is needed anywhere in any uh, new conventional oil and gas or any new coal um, to keep get to net zero. Um, and that's why what we're here planned by the companies um, bidding for these new licenses is just so undermining to climate climate goals and why all the work everyone on the school is doing to keep fossil fuels in the ground is just so important. So what does this all mean for companies whose strategy is based on all fossil fuel demand and growth? Well, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, uses different scenarios to test what um, future demand and use might be steps, um, which is a state of policy scenario, more as a business as usual proxy, has very slow change. The sustainable development scenario, which is probably most associated with uh, two degrees, uh, still has quite significant um, um, uh, demand constraints or cuts. And the net zero demand, as you can see in the green, uh, falls. What this essentially means is that um, major oil and gas producers are, are in runoff. They're not investing in, in new oil and gas um, exploration. Some of them may be expanding existing projects, which we think is something to be, uh, we need to pay a, a careful attention to. Uh, but we certainly don't be need, we won't be needing any exploration in protected areas, whether it's the Arctic to, um, or, or or the Amazon or anywhere else. So what what um, will keep oil and gas in the ground? How do we decide which projects are most vulnerable? Well, we take the view that during the energy transition and at a time when a lot of uh, there's a lot of electrification going in and transport, the um, that will lead to softer oil and gas prices. This is really important because not every single project is the same from a cost of production point of view. You've got a lot of production out there, which requires oil to be $100 a barrel um, to get a break even. Um, there's a lot of production out there that doesn't need that high, particularly the Middle East, you know, you're producing five, six, seven dollars a barrel. Um, there's a lot about there, which is 20 or $30 a barrel. So. What we did um, is we intersected the sustainable development scenario, uh, one, which is 1.65 uh, Celsius, with the supply curve to come up with a, a, a rough price of around um, $30, $35 a barrel. And what we're essentially saying is that everything above that is, um, is going to go, which is another way of saying there's a lot of Middle East producers will survive. A lot of commercial private sector and listed companies will not. Um, why haven't we got one and a half degrees on there? For the very simple reason that at one and a half degrees, no new investment is needed. So we're not um, putting a break even price in there because actually you're going to get an awful lot lower to be associated with one and a half degrees. We then, and all of this we've published off Carbon Tracker's website. Um, there's two reports which um, you might want to look at. One is called Paris Maligned where we've uh, analyzed all of the planned capital expenditure of the listed oil and gas companies, all the majors. Um, and then there's another one called Absolute Impact. Um, and this is used similar to others. We've used Rystad Energy. Um, and what we're looking at here is the future investment planned by the listed companies and how much of that is aligned with different scenarios. And as you can see with the red, a huge amount of the planned capex by the listed oil and gas majors is not only outside uh, the sustainable development scenario, the one associated with two degrees, but an awful lot is way above that in the step scenario. So expecting two to three degrees of warming. Um, and um, there's quite a few well-known names there that uh, are still investing in projects which take you outside of the sustainable development scenario. Um, and um, this is how we see it. So what this allows shareholders to do is to challenge companies project by project of which ones not to go ahead. We've also looked at exposure um, of different stock exchanges as to their alignment. And as you can see here, um, uh, New York, Sydney, pretty much every major exchange there, um, the investment plans of the companies listed on those exchanges are way outside of um, um, our goals to keep to well below two degrees. So I'm just going to finish on two slides, I, I, two or three slides. I think it's always important to have some good news. This is a slide I've taken from Ember, Ember's latest analysis. And what you can see there in the green is that EU wind and solar um, generates more power than gas for the first time. 
Um, there's a slight blip post um, COVID and, and also because of the crisis in Ukraine, uh, you see a slight tick up with coal. But the point being here is that we're building out capacity very, very fast indeed for renewables. Um, and I've taken this from uh, Reistead, but also put together by my good friends at Rocky Mountain Institute, where they're forecasting very, very rapid declines in oil demand and gas demand, not as rapid as we would want to get to avoid one and a half degrees. But the point being is that uh, the end is in sight in, in many of these scenarios, completely contrary to what, of course, the oil and gas sector is saying. I'm going to stop sharing from here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, it was nice, nice to end on a on a positive note after after that. Um, it was really useful to hear about the overall perspective uh, from the company side, um, and this is why I think conversations like this are quite important to accelerate those downward curves. And um, with uh, with that, we can go on to our next uh, and final speaker, Joe Eisen. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks for that, Francisco, and and thanks, Mark, and other presenters. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, I guess my my presentation, and I'll try and be quick because I know we're not we're not we're not blessed with time, is to look at some of the the kind of practical challenges of of the protected area model as a means for for stopping or reducing oil and gas development, particularly in tropical forest areas. Um, so for those of you that don't know us, uh, the Rainforest Foundation UK is an NGO based in London, uh, whose mission is to support indigenous and local communities of the world's rainforests in their efforts to, to protect their land and livelihoods. Um, so just to map out the threat, um, in, in Africa's Congo Basin, which is, which is the kind of main region that we're working with our local uh, and indigenous partners, um, so we looked. Uh, um, we did some joint research with with uh, an American uh, nonprofit, Earth Earth Insight, looking at the um, kind of oil and gas threat in in Africa as a whole. And uh, the research basically found that there's there, there's set to be a fourfold increase in 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 the amount of uh, land that's allocated or designated for oil and gas development. Uh, pretty scary. Pretty scary stuff. Um, but then we decided to go a little bit sort of deeper and focus particularly on, on the Congo Basin, obviously the world's second largest rainforest. And as you may have seen in, in the media recently, the, the DRC government has, has just announced an, an auction of 30 oil and gas blocks in, in the country. And these ones in, in yellow are the ones under auction and the ones that aren't highlighted, uh, are, are designated, but, but, but may well be. Altogether, those the, the entire uh, oil and gas uh, designations there cover 64 million hectares of forest uh, of, of of land. Sorry, and that's that that's equivalent of about four times the size of England. Um, in the actual yellow auctioned oil blocks, uh, that's about 28 million hectares, and of that, around 11, 11 million hectares of forest of, of dense high tropical forest is 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 under auction at the moment. Um, now we wanted to also map out what the what the social uh, and human impacts of all development in the Congo Basin were, and these areas not particularly decipherable. But these are these in yellow. These are populated places. These are these these are communities, indigenous and local communities that live in the forest. And one of the things we do at RFUK is to support them to map their land and to put themselves on the map to claim claim rights to these areas. And um, altogether, there's 36 million. Uh, people uh, that live within these oil blocks and 15 million live within the auctioned oil blocks in, in, in the DRC and some other ones that are, have been appraised in the um, in the Republic of Congo. This is a map showing the overlap between the oil and gas blocks with with areas that are inhabited and used by by indigenous peoples in the Congo. And over here you see the overlap, the, in these areas in pink, these are the, the Kuvit Central peatlands. So the largest peatlands on earth and the largest terrestrial carbon sink on earth. Um, so yep, yeah, they're under threat as well. Uh, here is uh, emissions reductions program. So this has been the key kind of 
policy tool in the Congo Basin over, over the past 15 years or so to, to address deforestation. And as you can see, there's a significant overlap there between uh, the oil blocks and these so-called uh, emissions reductions programs. And of course, there's, there's around about a dozen um, uh, protected areas that fall, fall within these areas. So the, the threat is real and it's, and, 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 and it's manifesting in, in, in different ways uh, across the Congo Basin. So just laying, just putting that out there to kind of set the context a little bit. So what, what are our options in, in, in dealing with oil and gas uh, development in, in the Congo? And I guess the first one um, to talk about, because it's the subject of, 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 this, of this seminar, and um, uh, again, just to talk about some of the practical challenges of it. Um, yes, in, in many ways, these, these areas exist. They have some level of international recognition. Uh, they're already defined with some or different degrees of protected status. Um, at COP15 in, in Montreal back in December, there was a, an international commitment to pretty much nearly double uh, the globally protected area uh, by 2030. Uh, so that again, that's a that, that's an opportunity to really, really kind of ramp up um, uh, this, this 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 particular angle of dealing with the oil and gas campaign. However, and I think this is something that that, that Matt um, uh, picked up on in his point whether indigenous territories would be included in this designation, and it's important to. Kind of make the distinction between protected areas in different parts of the world. I mean, in in the Amazon, most of them, you know, many indigenous lands and territories are regarded as as kind of protected areas. In the Congo, it's different. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll kind of return to that in a bit. Um, I mean, some of the risks of the protected area model is that by focusing too squarely on on protected areas, you risk displacing oil and gas development outside those areas. Um, Protected areas tend to be managed by international conservation organizations and, 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 and are often pretty costly and ineffective because of that. Um, and really importantly is that they often penalize those least responsible for the, for the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis, local and indigenous peoples who, who have, tend to have low impact livelihoods. So we we conducted some research on this, and we continue to conduct some research on on the kind of human impacts of of oil and gas. I mean, of protected areas in the Congo Basin. Um, so we looked at a model of around about thirty six protected areas out of about two hundred. So a decent sample. Um, and what we found that the, the these areas tend to be created without any any consultation of local and indigenous communities. Uh, let alone uh, the, the, the you know obtaining their free prior and informed consent. Um, many have led to displacements, whether that be physical or economic. Uh, many have been linked with severe human rights abuses uh, by by kind of conservation enforcement activities and and so called eco guards, um, and they tend to have brought very little developmental benefit to, 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 to local and indigenous communities as well. Um, so the point is that the protected area model itself uh, in certain parts of the world is, is ineffective um, and, and, and carries severe human impact. So when we talk about using protected areas as a model to, uh, to, to you know, limit oil and gas development, we need to be really kind of conscious of, of the kind of protected area that we're, that we're promoting um, and what the alternatives to that may be. Um, very quickly, and I know we haven't got much time for this, but uh, in terms of um, other approaches for dealing with oil and gas, uh, I mentioned in my, in my presentation that there was um, uh, an onset of uh, reductions programs in the Congo. Um, or otherwise known as reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation, uh, red plus. Um, again, this tends to lead to offsetting, which again tends to be a permit to pollute elsewhere. And of course, as you've pretty recently seen in, in the Guardian and, and various other investigations, carbon offsetting is a pretty flawed model. So just to kind of put that out there, is a, it's not a particularly good alternative to the protected area model. So, so what is um, so as part of the campaign that we're that we're currently uh, working on with some people on this call, uh, a big bit of it is empowering kind of local civil society. 
to to kind of address questions around you know does oil and development bring development or does it not bring development um, understanding and exposing some of the underlying governance issues in which oil and gas developments takes place you know who who benefits from oil and gas development um, and what are the underlying underlying drivers of it uh, but essentially one of the most important things and this is something that we do as an organization is you need rather than sort of going for the classic strictly protected area model what you need to do is increase community control over land so develop a model of protection that is founded on the human rights of the people that live there and of course we need to use all this to mobilize international support in the climate and biodiversity agendas and find ways of leveraging investment in in the green transition so just to just to leave on the um on one slide actually is that at the moment in in the drc uh, there's there's currently three million hectares of forest that are done the, under the control of local and indigenous communities so that's about the size of belgium um, there's potentially 70 million hectares that could be allocated for this purpose so i think one of the big things that we we aim to do and need to do is to really kind of scale up community control over the land because ultimately they are the uh, the best defenders of it um, so thanks, thanks for your time and uh, looking forward to some discussion. Thank you, Joe. Um, it was really interesting to hear about the, the, the human community perspective as well. I think this is uh, a really important issue. And of course, there is a need to be sensitive to the, the local context. Um, and uh, I think it is through uh, a wide variety of of uh, of different approaches that uh, we are going to be maximizing uh, the amount of fossil fuels that we can we can keep in the ground so very very interesting thank you and uh, yes indeed let's open let's open up the discussion uh, we have uh, a bunch of time for for some questions uh, as as before uh, we can raise your hands uh, when we want to, to ask a question. I'll keep a note of the order. And um, any, any first volunteers? Kel. Yeah, I have a question for Mark. Um, I think it was very interesting that Joe said, that Joe raised the issue or the question, are protected areas a useful tool? And I think the, the fact that in so many protected areas around the world, governments fail to stop the fossil fuel industry from entering, uh, it, it really, uh, I think is a really valid question. And I, ask, I have asked myself many times, what, what, what mechanisms do we have to stop the rollback of any of any successes of the keep it in the ground movement, because you know President Obama he uh, you know established some protected areas and then comes Trump and then he rolls it back and then the oil industry goes in and drills there, or you know in in uh, uh, Angola and in Bolivia they change the law so you can drill in protected areas and so it, it feels like we really need something to lock this in so that this doesn't happen. And I think that Joe has pointed to uh, uh, actors who, who are on the ground, you know, who defend their lands um, if they have the tools to do so and they need support. Now, my question to you, Mark, is what, what's the other side of the picture? You know, the people who are uh, proposing the projects, financing the projects, um, you know, pushing this forward and putting the profits in their pocket from destroying these lands and, and getting the fossil fuels out. Um, what what are the the tools out there um, to uh, you know? Because I think sitting in the global north and cities and so on, that that's the end of the picture where we uh, where 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 we should get involved. So I'd like to hear a little bit about what's you know what's the toolbox that we have for uh, uh, intervening on that end of the picture. So. T today, I don't know how many of you saw it, Barclays Bank produced a client report on the um, uh, pipeline, the Tatar pipeline in Uganda. So Barclays sent out a team of analysts to go and do a site visit and due diligence, and then they produced a 20-page report for Barclays Bank's clients. Um, 
basically saying, you know, the local community is all going to get compensated. What's what's the big deal here? If the way I would see it is that to respond to that, um, local communities that are on the receiving end of this pipeline uh, and scientists need to rebut Barclays and to produce a counter report essentially telling people what's really going on um, and then making sure that Barclays clients and the directors of the bank and the analysts um, hear it the other way. Because otherwise what happens is that um, investors go away thinking, look, everything's okay. But what I know from my own experience, and I've done this for I don't know, 20, 30 years, ever since, ever since I brought surfers against sewage 30 years ago to present to the shareholders of um, Southwest Water, which is a listed company in the UK market that had a big problem with water sewage outfalls on, on the Cornish coast. Um, investors will listen to the other side uh, if, if they're presented with accurate information. But I want to be clear, I mean, they can intervene, they can challenge management, they can even propose projects not to go ahead and they can remove board directors if they do. But it's not the same thing as governments acting. But as you say, Carl, I mean, governments come and go and you can change what they do. Uh, so you kind of kind of caught in a little bit of a trap. Uh, which, as you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Fossil Fuel, fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty, um, which, is a, which would be a global agreement of governments to give up production rights. And uh, it hasn't been mentioned today, but last week, six island, Pacific Island states, the Solomon Islands and, and Vanuatu and many of the others, came out in support of both uh, a global treaty and they also came out in support of the, uh, the Global Registry of Fossil Fuels. Uh, essentially saying we should map all the planned production and then have a sensible international agreement of governments to permanently retire licenses and give up production sites. I don't know if that's answered your question. I've, I've had a bit of a go there. Yeah, thanks. Maybe, Joe, do you want to also add something to that picture? Because it feels like when, when I heard you speak, I was thinking, okay, yeah, we just need to, uh, you know, strengthen the work of the Rainforest Foundation, get it uh, multiplied a hundred times, and, and then, you know, these, uh, you know, support their communities with mapping and with connections, communications, and so on, and know their rights. I was, I didn't say, but uh, I went to the DRC uh, forests uh, almost 20 years ago uh, for the Rainforest Foundation, and uh, you know, talk to the people about their their legal rights to their forests and how to defend them and so on. So I'm quite close uh, to, to, to the work you're doing. Um, I wonder if there are other things that uh, you, you, you can see that this space could provide or, you know, there are ways, because in a sense, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, governments have protected these places. They have already pledged to not extract. So this is like their own commitment. So we should hold them to their work, but it's more, it's more an advocacy tool than something that will, you know, naturally get implemented. It's almost like the human rights, you know, the human rights are very high standard and you can use them to argue if they're not being met somewhere. And so we, we, we wanna use this to hold uh, governments to account. But um, yeah, there, there are discussions going on, for example, from the non-proliferation treaty that Mark mentioned, um, you know, if there were uh, different protocols or different uh, uh, things that governments could pledge under such a treaty, it seems like this would be a, a, a low uh, hanging fruit in that sense. But um, yeah, I'd like to hear more from Joe, like what, what we can, what else we can do to support this work of empowering the local communities to really look after themselves and their forests and defend that plan. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, our, our view, you know, that the, the, the forests under the control of local and indigenous communities uh, is not only the most just way of protecting forests, it's also the most effective way of, of, of protecting forests. Well, well, somewhat peripheral, actually, I think maybe, you know, even 10 years ago, five, 10 years ago, um, that, that, that view is now pretty mainstream. Uh, and it's increasingly backed up by various different scientific st studies. And, and that kind of came to the fore, I think, at, at, at COP26 in Glasgow, where, where, where you had this $1.7 billion commitment from, from, from governments and key, key, key foundations 
um, supporting the you know the local and um, tenure rights of of indigenous of indigenous peoples. And for us and for us, that was a bit of a milestone to get to that point. I think where we're at now is is needing to find the ways to mobilize that kind of funding at scale. Um, so yeah, doing the things like the mapping, the mapping work, doing things like investing in in frontline defenders and indigenous organizations, um, helping them build their organizational capacity, linking bi uh, biodiversity and, and climate funding to con kind of conditionalities on human rights. Um, all these things can can make a big difference. Um, and I think another key key piece of the puzzle, the puzzle, uh, and this is the, the, something that Mark, Mark mentioned in his and and Alice mentioned in her presentation, was about new new fossil fuel developments in in the global north. And you know when you work in a country like like the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is you know which is poor and need, needs development. It, it it really leaves a sour taste in in their mouth to be lectured by by people in the global north telling them they can't develop on fossil fuel development while we're still doing it. Um, so I think there's need that, that, that you know we need to call out the hypocrisy. Uh, we need to call out people that that, that 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 promote things like carbon offsetting schemes, which which kind of further kick the can down the road, um, and and really invest in in you know national local people and their institutions so again i'm not sure if i fully answered your question there but um uh there's definitely a movement it needs to it, but it needs to be you know accelerated this thank you everyone any any others James? I just want to make a point addressing the, the, the last issue that Joe made about uh, indigenous people in, in tropical areas uh, <clears throat> resenting the imposition of, of uh, climate control. They are going to be damaged first and they are going to be damaged worse. Now, I don't know how it's going to be possible to put that point across, but that's the way to go. It's not to point out the short-term employment possibility, but their medium-term extinction certainties. Now, how, do, how it goes about this, I really don't know. That's a point that Alice made to me earlier in our discussion about how to penetrate political structures in, in the United Kingdom. Um, <clears throat> see where the opposition is and point out to them what the advantages of control and the disadvantages of the lack of control. Thank you, James. Um, Joe, did you want to react to that perhaps? Yeah, I I, I agree. And I'm not, I think, you know, most, most communities would probably agree with your point as well, James. Um, but in terms of you know the legitimacy of our own campaigning on these issues and our own advocacy on these issues, we've really got to get our own house into order first, right? Um, yeah, through 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 the various different means. Thanks, Joe. Um, if there are no other questions, maybe um, I could ask one. This isn't directed uh, specifically to any speaker, whoever wanted, wants to, to jump in. Um, I was wondering uh, whether um, compensation mechanisms uh, for keeping it in the ground are a, a viable option to address the issue of fossil fuels in, in protected areas. I know that there was um, initiatives uh, that already uh, attempted this, uh, like the Yasuni. Um, and I was wondering if there are any emerging uh, solutions or mechanisms such as, you know, G just as, um, just energy transition partnerships that uh, could provide a, a favorable push in this direction. Uh, can I just respond to that, Francisco? Of course. It, 
I think it's 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 going to be problematic, and I I'll, I'll explain why. Um, when oil's at eighty hundred dollars a barrel, everyone wants to produce, and everyone's going to have a go at producing. But in an era of falling demand, uh, which we think will happen because of electrification, um, we're going to see millions of barrels of oil demand a day destruct destruct demand destruction over the next decade. That will lead to falling prices. Now, if you if you are a country where none of your projects are economic um, below fifty dollars a barrel, but the oil price is at thirty, why should we compensate? Why should the world compensate you for not producing? Because you're never going to produce anyway, because you're not going to be because you're going to be uneconomic as a producer. Um, well, I so and I think that's true. You know, it's a global problem uh, actually. What I prefer is um, production rights. Uh, under an international agreement. So countries which are obviously low cost producers will negotiate the rights to produce um, and the payments for a right to produce. So at the moment, the Saudis are being paid $80, $90 a barrel and their production costs are $5 a barrel. Okay, nobody taxes them really. I think that there should be an international agreement that says the Saudis should pay say, I don't know, $40 a barrel to produce and sell at 50 or 60 or whatever the market price is. And, and that that payment that they the world receives should then be transferred to the global south to fund loss and damage. Um, and that kind of compensation, a production right, uh, permit system uh, is going to be more equitable. So a low cost producer will buy a production right. And to buy that production right, they have to compensate everyone else in the global south, whether you're, whether you're an owner of fossil fuels or not. That's how I see it, but that's just me. Thank you, Mark. Um, Kel, would you like to react? Yeah, no, I think thanks, Mark, for pointing to the burning need to regulate fossil fuel extraction on a global scale. And I think that, you know, this year's uh, COP hosted by an oil CEO uh, might be an opportunity to have that conversation for real because they're positioning themselves as this moral leader and uh, you know they're involved in renewables they're uh, also expanding which is i think not compatible with uh, with that uh, responsibility but i think that the conversation needs to be had and mechanisms to to deal and i i think in what you describe there is a lot of um, promise in terms of more stability more predictability in the markets and uh, meeting climate targets um, I just wanted to uh, uh, bring one proposal into the mix uh, of how this um, um, this argument of you know you, you don't need to compensate them because uh, the market's not going to let them uh, extract and sell it anyway. Um, how that could be turned around in a in a sense, and that is a proposal that was made by uh, Mia Motley and uh, the folks from Barbados on how to deal with uh, mitigation, and they said. Let's auction it. Let's say, uh, you know, who gives us how many million tons of CO2 mitigation and then uh, you get the funding. And that is, uh, I believe, a very promising mechanism because as the oil price goes up and down, when it goes down, you will uh, get many gigatons of fossil fuels for basically nothing. But it would have to be a commitment to keep that in the ground. And then when the, uh, when the price goes back up, that commitment will already be you know, legally protected or whatever it is. So it, to me, it seems like this uh, price uh, uh, swings in the fossil fuel markets could, uh, uh, together with a uh, an auction type mechanism, could make it possible to really take a lot, a lot of fossil fuels off the books and off the uh, prospects of extraction when the prices go down. So that's just one additional idea out there that's being discussed to, to put into the mix that might make it possible for something like this to go forward. Thank you, Kel, for that response. Um, uh, Joe, did you uh, put your hand on because the point was addressed, or were you expecting? Yeah, to you know, yeah. I mean, just uh, yeah. I mean, I, I just think yeah. I think I think we we can't we can't rely on the market uh, to solve this issue. And I think the kind of thing that, that that Mark was talking about, loss and damage. I mean, how how you can mobilize and tax that you know that level of of um, you know revenues. Um, for the good of the global, for the good of the global South. Um, of course, 
the global south is a very kind of broad term and it's it it's it's how you can ensure that 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 funding is you know leads to governance reforms leads to you know greater recognition of local and indigenous people's rights etc cetera, etc cetera. um because unless you address the governance angle then you're only going to ever make so much progress uh, in places like the dr congo thanks mark uh joe that's uh very very true um matt did you want to react oh uh, yeah yeah thank you i actually have uh two questions uh perhaps from mark or, or, or others i'm not sure um one is I'm, I'm curious in terms of the long-term viability of individual companies, oil producing companies, um, whether or not you or anybody else has taken a look at, um, you know, if we have, as, as Kill, I think mentioned, uh, uh, increasing fluctuations and in, uh, price per barrel of oil. I'm curious, you know, it seems like the, the companies that have projects that can cycle on and off faster are going to be the ones that can respond to that sort of changing price environment uh, in a way that keeps them alive, whereas the ones that have you know high cost, uh, long term production like tar sands, oil sands, uh, would not be able to respond to you know low low oil price conditions in any meaningful way and would be the first to go. So I'm I'm sort of curious if there's an assessment out there which which companies and projects in which parts of the world um, can actually survive in a you know, a highly volatile oil price market. Uh, that, that's the first question. Um, and then the second one is, you know, I understand based on the presentations and and who's on this call that, uh, you know, oil production and keeping it in the ground is the the key focus. But Kelly, you know, you mentioned uh, direct regulation worldwide of, of production. Um, one of the things that we're working on in California, which is not necessarily unique, but is is fairly distinct from other places, is that the refineries themselves are really feel like the key throttle point for the fossil fuel um, supply chain or the oil supply chain and directly regulating refineries there seems like a, a super important uh, next step on oil policy. And I'm curious if anybody here is looking at refineries as a key throttle point in the oil supply chain in other parts of the world, check. Uh, just a quick reaction on my side, Matt. Um, sh sh short cycle projects where you can get to produce very quickly. Uh, Shell's an example of that. Um, you know, they can get to produce relatively quickly. It's the long cycle where you're you're going to investing now, and you're probably not going to see any production for six, seven, eight, nine years. Uh, they're the ones that are most vulnerable. Um, and we've tried to go into that in our um, absolute impact and Paris mining reports off our website to try and differentiate between uh, the two. And obviously the Middle East, I mean, no one truly knows how what the Saudis have got, but they are still a swing producer in the sense that they can rapidly increase production um, if asked to. We accept um, high prices and keeping constraint on supply does them rather well when you know prices are as high as they are now. Relatively speaking. Thank you. I would just jump in and say that in our project, we're also looking into what we call the enablers in different uh, parts of the of the life chain of of the fossil fuel industry. So we're also looking at very uh diverse and different um facilities infrastructures uh, and other companies that are supporting the industry and we want to highlight through specific stories the the holistic bigger picture also in that aspect and very much not focusing only on the fossil fuel let's say the classical fossil fuel companies themselves so we're definitely doing a lot a lot a lot of work there um, also, thanks for your question on the refineries. While I don't have an answer, um, I have been talking to some of your colleagues about similar analyses, and I know that great work, you, work you've done 
uh, on identifying where the crude from the Amazon is going and then campaigning on those uh, companies and the airport in, uh, in California, Los Angeles, if I'm not mis mistaken. I, I do think that there is uh, uh, a future for that kind of uh, data being put out there and campaigned on because now we do have a climate movement of many millions of people and I think that if we can point to for example fossil fuels coming from protected areas and we can follow where it's going I think there are lots of people willing to you know <laughs> lock, lock themselves to the to the door of the facility or uh, do other acts of civil disobedience because as a friend of mine who uh, uh, shut down a Carson's pipeline coming out of Canada said, he said, I'm duty bound. I have to stop what's going on. It's my duty to protect life and protect my children. And I think there are increasing numbers of people out there who are following that mindset and uh, are willing to act on uh, just shutting down the wrong, the, the wrong things going forward. So I think, uh, you know, providing the data and providing the information of where these things are flowing, where they're going through, um, also for carbon bombs, for protected areas and other things. I think that is an empowerment tool for the climate movement in the global north, uh, who are often on the receiving end of, of that to say, we don't want this and we'll, we'll, we'll shut it down. Hey, I guess just a follow up comment on that is like, I th feel like we have with the oil, crude oil production of very, very distributed geographically a uh, set of you know, points or pipelines or storage or whatnot. And we have a very limited number of places where that oil gets turned into the product that people actually use. And I think uh, there's, an, there's an opportunity to consider how the two relate, like you were just saying. Um, and, and I think uh, refineries as a vulnerable part of that supply chain in terms of campaigning and regulation seem very interesting to me. So thanks. Thanks, everyone. So we have uh, come to the end of the hour and a half. And uh, just to, to close, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining. Special thanks to the speakers for sharing um, their perspectives on the issue. I hope that this was uh, an interesting and stimulating session for everyone. And uh, if people would like to interact uh, with the uh, lingo analysis uh, i have just left my email in the chat so feel free to copy that uh, and reach out to me with uh, any further questions that weren't addressed in this webinar um, and with that i wish everybody a pleasant evening or afternoon or morning depending on where you are in the world thanks guys good work Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.